grace be to you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. As I indicated, the text will be our epistle reading read earlier, 2 Corinthians 5, 1 to 10. And I'll introduce the sermon with verse 1. We know that if the tent, which is our earthly home, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. This is our text. Dear Christian friends, many families enjoy camping, and yours may be among them. Such families enjoy spending time out in the great outdoors, away from home, away from work, away from the conveniences and amenities of life. The kind of camping I have in mind is not the kind done in a fully equipped RV, but camping in a canvas tent where you sleep on the hard ground, ward off the critters, and battle the elements. In the minds of some people, that's actually considered fun. Now, I've done the camping thing a time or two as a kid back in, well, back in Bunker Hill. Venturing no further than the backyard. The sleep was lousy. The mosquitoes were annoying. And I was glad to get back into my own room and my own bed by the next night. Needless to say, I'm pretty well cured of the camping bug. Now, I admit that my appreciation of camping may be far different than yours, and you're certainly entitled to your opinion. But I bring up the subject only to make a connection with our text, where the Apostle Paul speaks of our living in the tent, which is our earthly home. Paul's words give to the Corinthians, to us, give us a unique view of both our earthly existence and our heavenly future. And he does so with some rather unusual imagery. Then again, maybe it's not so unusual when you remember that St. Paul was a tent maker by trade. What Paul does is describe our present life, our bodily existence, as living in an earthly tent. In contrast to that, he speaks of life in heaven as having a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Let me ask you, when you looked at yourself in the mirror this morning, was the first thought that came to your mind, how is the old tent doing today? I don't think so. But the comparison isn't really so far-fetched. What is a tent, anyway? It's a dwelling place that is usually intended only to be temporary. Think back to the example of the tabernacle in the Old Testament. Just as the tabernacle, which was nothing more than a glorified tent, was the temporary dwelling of God from the time of the Israelite wanderings in the wilderness until King Solomon completed construction of a permanent temple in Jerusalem. So also Paul's body and ours is merely temporary. Yes, a tent can be wonderful for a while, it serves its purpose well for a time. But who would want to inhabit one forever? Especially if there is something better to be had. And Paul has something better, far better in mind. What Paul looks forward to is a building from God, an eternal house in heaven. To add further contrast, he describes it as not built by human hands. In other words, by God. This is similar to what Jesus was referring to in John chapter 14 when he said, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. You probably recall that the King James Version speaks of many mansions, which conjures up certain images of grandeur, in our minds, homes of the rich and famous. But the emphasis isn't on their grandeur and magnificence, but rather on their permanence. The rooms in our Father's heavenly house will last and last and last. They'll be our home for all 
eternity. We are people of two homes, one temporary, one eternal, <coughs> just as we are people of two countries, the earthly and the heavenly. That's why the Bible speaks of us as pilgrims, sojourners. We're just passing through. Like the children of Israel who wandered 40 years in the desert, living in tents, heading for the promised land, we are traveling, walking as we sang through life. This desert drear, as one hymn puts it, you remember, I'm but a stranger here, heaven is my home. Earth is a desert drear. But we are on our way, we're headed for our promised land. Certainly there is much about this present world, this present life, that is not so dreary. And thank God for that. God richly blesses us with many things that give meaning and purpose that add happiness and pleasure to life. He richly and daily provides us with all that we need to support this body and life, as, as Luther's words from his explanation of the first article of the Apostles' Creed, as he puts it there. But life in this world is never fully satisfied, never completely happy, never entirely pleasing. That's just stating the facts. And it's all because of the reality of sin. The sin of our first parents in the Garden of Eden, Eden spoiled the very good, the perfect world that God had created. And we who follow in the footsteps of our first parents carry on their legacy as we sin against God in thought, word, and deed. In a sinful world, a world in which we have contributed our own share of disobedience and sin, we encounter troubles and trials, sickness and suffering. We face personal struggles, family problems, stresses at work. Each passing day we get older and sometimes life gets tougher and harder to bear. Change and decay in all around we see. In case you need convincing, compare your picture for the new directory with any picture from, say, 20, 40, 60 years ago. The pressures you face, the sorrows you endure, the trials you battle are all part of what Paul considers as life in this tent. St. Paul captures this dynamic when he says, in this tent we groan. This groaning is that spirit-given longing for deliverance, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. It is our eager longing for the glorious future that God has promised, which Paul speaks of in his letter to the Romans as the redemption of our bodies and the glory that will be revealed in us. Such groaning always presumes the burdens of this present life, the experiences and circumstances of life, which are often painful. Yes, Christians, we Christians, are not exempt from problems and pain. They live in the same fallen world as everyone else. But Paul is giving us comfort and courage in our text. He is helping us look beyond the present to the future, to life, looking at it from God's perspective. Paul is reminding us that everything we experience here on earth has a time limit. We're tent dwellers, soon to exchange the earthly for the heavenly, these lowly bodies for heavenly bodies, the perishable with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. It's this heavenly perspective that gives us confidence and courage for living now, even as we await God's future. We have, in the words of the hymn writer, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. While we may be knocked down by trials and trouble, we get up again and keep going, keep moving forward toward our future. 
we keep moving. For with daily bread, God also provides daily strength, daily help in time of our need. I love that verse from Deuteronomy. As your days are, so shall your strength be. Your strength will equal your days. Is this all just a pipe dream? No. Here as elsewhere, Paul uses the language of faith, the language of confidence, of certainty. We know that we have a building from God, eternal in the heavens. And why is he so confident? Because God's promises are always reliable. In fact, God's promises are so reliable that Paul uses a present tense verb. We have, not we will have, but we have a building from God. Even though he's still in the tent of his earthly existence. If God has said it, God's children have it. No question about it. While you may still be paying the mortgage, mortgage on your current home, the good news is that your new home won't have a mortgage on it. It's been built, and it's been paid for up front by the suffering, death, and resurrection of Christ. It's yours, free and clear, a gift from God, yours through faith in Jesus. As Paul says, he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. The Holy Spirit, through the means of grace, through word and sin, calls us by the gospel. He works in us the faith in Christ, which is the key to unlock the door to our new home. Having brought us to faith, he applies the benefits of Christ's redeeming work, forgiveness, life, salvation, to each believer, to you and me. The presence of the Holy Spirit in our hearts means that we have forgiveness and life with God now, as well as God's personal guarantee of more to come. That one day at Christ's return, we will see our bodies transformed into the likeness of Christ's glorified body for life in the world to come. No, we're not there yet. Our hair is thinning and graying. Our bones are creaking. Our waistlines are sagging. Our eyesight is weakening. In the words of the hymn we sang, we walk in danger all the way. We pass through trials all the way, and death pursues us all the way. No, we're definitely not there yet. Indeed, we may have years of struggle ahead of us, but we're never alone. And we're never without resources. We walk with Jesus all the way, as the hymn also reminds us, as well as with the angels whom he sends to protect and defend us. What's more, God's promise, God promises us a glorious future, and that bolsters our courage and gives us hope. The Holy Spirit has called us by the gospel, enlightened us with his gifts, sanctified and kept us in the true faith. Through such, such things as the water and word of holy baptism, the gospel which is preached, proclaimed to you, the absolution from, uh, pronounced in Christ's dead, and the sacrament of Christ's body and blood, he works the miracle of faith in your hearts and mine, so that we confidently confess in the Nicene Creed, I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. And in the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. We look for and believe in these things because we haven't seen them, at least not with our physical eyes. And so with the Apostle Paul, we live each day walking by faith, not by sight. We rely daily on the promises of God from His Holy Word. We trust that He will do all that He has promised to do even before all the evidence is in, even before all our questions have been answered. We also make it our life's goal to please God. 
We want to live our lives for Him who died and rose for us. We see our vocations as opportunities to serve God by serving one another. All that we do, we do to glorify God. Because our future is secure and heaven is our home, we live our lives in the present in light of those realities that are still to come. One day we will join the angels in doing God's will joyfully and perfectly in heaven. Until then, we joyfully strive to do His will here on earth. No, we don't get it completely right. We mess up and need forgiveness, but that doesn't stop us from trying. We're not afraid to try and fail. We're not afraid to fall on our face because we know we have a gracious God who will pick us up, dust us off, and send us out to try again. Yes, we will all appear one day, as Paul says, before the judgment seat of Christ to receive what is due for what we have done in this life in the body, whether good or evil. But that isn't a cause for fear and dread, not for the Christian, as might be expected given our history of sins. I know what you thought of that when we first read it earlier. Well, at first reading, Paul's words seem to imply that we will be saved by our works or condemned by our lack of works. Well, this would contradict what St. Paul says very clearly elsewhere, that we are saved, what, by grace, through faith, and not by works. So how are we to understand Paul's words? A little difference between uh, law and gospel here. At the judgment seat of Christ, we will receive either good or bad, not because of, but in accordance with what we have done in the body, the good works which the Holy Spirit has worked in us after working faith in our hearts. Our works give evidence of, are the fruits of the faith which the Spirit has created. It will always and ever be what Christ did in His body, first by a holy life and then on the cross in payment for our sins, that secures for us the verdict, not guilty, forgive, and opens the door to heaven. In the words of the hymn writer, Thy works, not mine, O Christ, speak gladness to this heart. They tell me all is done. They bid my fear depart. And so it is that we look forward to that day when what is mortal will be swallowed up by life, real life, everlasting life, God's life. When our tenting days will be over and our glory days will have just begun. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus.